So this is your fourth mechanics lecture. In this lecture, we're going to be looking at friction, air resistance, kinetic energy, and work. So the textbook reference for this lecture is section 6.1, 6.2, 7.1, 7.2, .1, and 3.3. .3. So first of all, a quick recap of the most important things we saw last lecture. In the last lecture, we saw how we could draw a free body diagram to represent all the forces which are acting upon a body. We saw that a force is needed to change the motion of a body, so this was Newton's first law. We also had a look at Newton's second law, which tells us that the net force on the body is equal to the product of the body's mass and its acceleration. So as an equation, we can write it this way. The net force is the sum of all the forces which are acting upon it, and that is equal to the mass times the acceleration, which is a vector. And then we also saw Newton's third law, that for every action there is an opposite and equal reaction. After that, we had a look at how to solve some problems using Newton's three laws. We also had a look at Hooke's law. Hooke's law tells us about the force from a spring. So we saw that the force from a spring can be approximated using Hooke's law, which is the force is equal to minus k times the displacement from equilibrium. So this is a restoring force where the force is directed back towards the equilibrium position, so in the opposite direction to the displacement. We saw that the centripetal force is a resultant force. The other forces acting on an object traveling around a circular path add to give this centripetal force. So this applies in situations such as bank curves, conical pendulums, and loop-the-loops. Okay, so we have kind of considered this question before. A mass is at rest on the incline plane show. What is the size of the frictional force acting on the mass? So how we do it, we've got the weight force acting down, mg. We've got the normal force, which is perpendicular to the plane. And then what we can do is break the weight force into a component parallel to the plane and perpendicular to the plane. So this angle in here is theta. And so perpendicular to the plane, we've got the mg cos theta. And parallel to the plane, we've got the mg sine theta. Now, the net force parallel to the plane must be zero. So this tells us that the frictional force must be equal to mg sine theta, as there is no net force parallel to the plane as the mass is at rest. So static friction. The block we just saw is experiencing the static friction force, which is preventing it moving down the plane. So in order for a body to start moving, the static friction force needs to be overcome. As theta increases, eventually there is so much weight force down the slope that friction is overcome and the block starts to slide. So this maximum static friction force can be modeled as the maximum static friction force is given by mu s, which is known as the coefficient of static friction times n, where n is the normal reaction force. So a question for you, what are the units for the coefficient of static friction? Well, hopefully you can see that this is a frictional force. So being a frictional force, it has units of newtons. The normal reaction force is also a force and so has units newtons. So because we've got newtons here and newtons here, it means that mu s must be unitless, i.e. it does not have any units. So then we ask the question, well, which mass will start to slide down the slope first if we have a heavy mass or a light mass? We observed that, in fact, the two masses started to slide down the slope at almost the same time. So let's have a look at why that is. So here's our slope at some angle theta. We've got our mass sitting on it. Now it's right on the verge of sliding, so it's got a weight force pulling it down, which we can split into a component parallel to the slope here, which is mg sine theta because this angle in here is theta and perpendicular to the slope mg cos theta. And then we've got a normal reaction force, which is perpendicular to the slope. Now we know that the frictional force when it's not sliding is equal to mg sine theta. We've already discussed that this lecture. And then we've just said, well, the maximum value that the static friction force can have is given by mu s times the normal force. Now, 
what's the normal force equal to? Well, the block isn't accelerating up off the slope or down into the slope. So perpendicular to the slope, the forces need to be balanced. So the only forces acting on it are the weight force and the normal force and the friction force. And the friction force is parallel to the slope, so it doesn't contribute. So we must have that, well, n is equal to mg cos theta. So the when we're putting in mu s n, we can put in mu s times mg cos theta. So what we're trying to do is find mu s. So let's take this part and rearrange it. And we've got, well, mu s is equal to mg sine theta divided by mg cos theta. And the mg's will cancel out. So we've got sine theta over cos theta which is tan theta. So that tells us that the coefficient of static friction is equal to tan theta. And as you can see in this equation, there is no dependence on the mass. So that experiment told us that there was no dependence upon the mass and the mathematics that we've just done helps to confirm that. So in this example, a two kilogram block is placed on a slope. The angle the slope makes with the horizontal is slowly increased from 0 degrees until theta equals 30 degrees, at which point the block starts to slide down the slope. And part 1 says, what is the normal force acting on the block at this point? Okay, so let's draw a diagram like we always do. So here it is. With the weight force down the slope, we can split it into its components, mg sine theta and mg cos theta. We've got the normal force and then we've also got the frictional force which should be the same length as this mg sine theta. So what normal force acts on the block at this point? Well perpendicular to the slope the forces are balanced so we have n is equal to mg cos theta so we can substitute in m is 2 kilograms g is 9.8 and then we've got times cos 30 because it's at the point where it just start, it's just about to start sliding. And so solving this, we end up with 17 newtons for the normal force. And then part two says, what frictional force acts on the block at this point? Well, at this point, these two are perfectly balanced. And so we have that the frictional force is equal to mg sine theta which is equal to 2 times 9.8 times sine 30, which is equal to 9.8 newtons. And then part 3 says, what is the coefficient of static friction? So this is the maximum static friction, which is equal to 9.8 newtons. We've just calculated it. And we also know it's equal to mu s times the normal force, which is equal to mu s times 17. So this tells us that mu s is equal to 9.8 newtons divided by 17 newtons. And so solving this, we get 0 0.58. Now alternatively, we could have done mu s was equal to tan theta, and that's equal to tan of 30. And when we do do it this way, we get the same answer, 0 0.58. So either of those ways works for finding our coefficient of static friction. Now, you will learn more about this in the static friction on an inclined plane laboratory exercise. Okay, now once an object starts to move, it has kinetic rather than static friction. So an object sliding over the surface experiences kinetic friction in the direction opposite to its motion. So we're asked to give an example of where you've observed this. So for example, if we push a textbook along a desk, it eventually comes to a stop because the kinetic friction is acting to oppose its motion and slow it down. So modeling kinetic friction. Kinetic friction can be modeled with the equation that the kinetic friction is equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force. So once again, we've got a force here in newtons and a force here in newtons. So the coefficient of kinetic friction is unitless. Now to practice using this equation for physics 1a, try question 6 in set 2 and the same for higher physics 1a. Okay, so in this question, we have a block which lies on the floor. So it's just like this. And we're asked, what is the magnitude of frictional force on it from the floor? 
Well, if it's just lying there, then there is no frictional force. So this is zero newtons. Now, if a horizontal force of five newtons is now applied to the block, okay, so here it comes, five newtons, but the block does not move, what is the magnitude of the frictional force on it? Well, because the block's not moving, we know that the net force on the block is zero. So the frictional force must oppose this five newtons, which is being applied. So it must have a magnitude of five newtons and it'll be directed in the direction opposite to the applied force. Now, if the maximum possible magnitude of the static friction force is 10 newtons, will the block start to move if eight newtons is applied to it horizontally? Well, no, because it can, won't move until a force of at least 10 newtons is applied to it. So this is no. So what would be the frictional force on the block in this case? Well, it'll still oppose the applied force. So that's still going to be eight newtons. So would the block start to move if 12 newtons was applied to it horizontally? And in this case, there is enough force to overcome the static friction force. So it will start to move. So yes. Okay, so let's just look in a bit of detail at the, the transition from static friction to kinetic friction. So what we're going to do is plot a graph showing the frictional force. versus time, while we are steadily increasing the applied force. Okay, so initially the block doesn't move. So as we steadily increase the force, the frictional force increases to oppose this force exactly. So it increases constantly with time to some maximum value. So this maximum value is equal to mu s N, that's the maximum static friction force. Now at that point, the block is just on the verge of moving. So it now starts to move and we have the frictional force opposing the motion, which is the kinetic friction force. So that force then remains constant with time and this force is equal to mu k n. So generally mu k is less than mu s. It's hard to get something moving, but once we start it moving, we don't need to apply as much force to keep it moving. So the frictional force versus time graph looks something like this. So what causes friction? Friction happens when two surfaces come in contact. So when we have very rough surfaces, then just a small amount of the surfaces are actually in contact. And so there tends to be less friction in these cases. When we have very smooth surfaces, then there's lots of surface area which is directly in contact. So we get interactions between the atoms in the two materials and these can effectively cold weld together so it can become very difficult to slide these objects over each other. Okay, so you've probably seen what happens to a car which is driving over an icy patch of road. Let's have a look at this example video. So you can see that the wheels have stopped turning and it's just slipping over the road and the driver's got very little control of what's going on. So little in fact that they're deciding to exit their vehicle. So when a car rolls along the road, then the point of contact between the car wheel and the road is actually stationary. So we have the coefficient of static friction between the wheel and the road. When the tire stops rolling and just skids over the road, in that case, we've got two moving surfaces up against each other. And so we need to apply the coefficient of kinetic friction. So let's calculate the stopping distance for these two different cases to see why we want wheels on a car to remain turning. So for a car traveling at 60 kilometers per hour, so the initial speed is equal to 60 kilometers 
per hour, which let's convert it into meters per second. So we can do that by dividing by 3.6 and we end up with 16.67 meters per second. We need to calculate the stopping distance if the wheels lock and again if the wheels continue to roll. Okay, so lock, this implies that it's, it's sliding over each other and so we use mu k which is equal to 0 0.35 and we have rolling which means that the surface between the wheel and the road is stationary. So we've got us which is equal to 0 0.70. So we're trying to get the stopping distance so the frictional force is a constant force so we can use our kinematic equations in this case so we will want to use the equation v squared equals u squared plus 2as as we know the final speed v is equal to zero because we're trying to get the stopping distance which is the distance it takes to come to a stop so i've chosen the kinematic equation that has my final speed in it and also my distance in it so we're looking at the horizontal distance in this case so as the car comes to a stop, the only force acting upon it is the frictional force, which is working to slow it down and is given by our appropriate coefficient times the normal force. And the normal force in this case is equal to mg as it's not on a slope or anything, we're assuming it's on a flat piece of road. So we've got that our frictional force is equal to mu times mg. So this tells us that our acceleration, ma, is equal to mu times mg. So our acceleration is equal to mu g. Okay, so we're trying to find the stopping distance. So let's rearrange this and we can write, well, s is equal to v squared minus u squared over 2a. And we've said v is equal to zero. So this is equal to minus mu squared over 2a. Now the negative we'd expect that because this is actually decelerating it, the frictional force is slowing it down. So we'd expect the acceleration to actually be a negative number. So let's calculate this for mu k is equal to 0 0.35. We've got u squared, I'm leaving off the negative, times 2 times mu k times g which is equal to 16.67 squared over 2 times 0 0.35 times 9.8 and solving that I end up with 81 meters and that's just two significant figures. Now for the rolling one it'll be the same equation but I'll use us. So I have s is equal to u squared over 2 mu s g which is equal to 16.67 squared over 2 times 0 0.70 times g, which is equal to 40 meters to two significant figures. So you can see when it's rolling, the stopping distance is significantly less. And this, be, this is because the coefficient of static friction is greater than the coefficient of kinetic friction. So we really want to try and keep the wheels on a car rolling so that it can stop quickly in an accident. So it's to keep the wheels rolling that engineers have developed anti-lock brake systems. So the anti-lock brake system monitors individual wheel speeds and if a wheel starts to slow, decelerates, sooner than the other wheels, then the ABS system can monitor this and ease off the hydraulic brake pressure to the wheel so that it doesn't lock and lose the grip. So from November 2019, Australia will fall in line with the likes of Europe and Japan Japan by mandating that all new road registrable bikes sold must be equipped with anti-lock brake systems. So this is already the rule for cars. So in effect, the new rules are harmonizing with the current EU standards and ABS is being required in cars since back in 2003. So bikes are just catching up now. Okay, so air resistance. We've actually seen the effects of air resistance before when we dropped um, objects in air and in a vacuum and we saw that the patty case took a lot longer to fall in air than in a vacuum. So what types of things do you expect air resistance to depend upon? So this was a question posed in class. 
and some things that air resistance you'd expect to depend upon would be surface area probably also the density of the air if you think of an object falling through water which is much more dense than air it tends to take longer to flow to fall through the more dense medium you possibly think that it depends on the velocity So it turns out that the air resistance can actually be modelled by this equation here, where in this equation the C is the drag coefficient, so this depends on the material. Rho is the density of the air or fluid through which the object's flowing. A is the cross-sectional area of the object, and V is the speed, so it depends on the speed square. So this is the drag force, so it's a force. Okay, so terminal velocity. Can you come up with an expression for the maximum speed an object can fall at? Now I've got a picture of a cat here because there's a somewhat famous study from New York where they investigated the safest um, levels in apartment blocks for cats to live in. Turns out that the worst floors are floor, around about floors 6 and 7. Above this, the cats have reached their terminal velocity if they fall out of an apartment block. So they have longer in the air to get themselves turned around and relax a little and land on their feet. From below that, below the 6th and 7th floor, they're not in the air as long so they haven't quite reached their terminal speed. So they hit the ground going at a lower speed. So they just collected this data from accidents around the city. They didn't go throwing cats out of windows. Okay, so if we want to work out the terminal speed of a cat like this, we need to draw a free body diagram. So we've got the weight force, which is pulling it down, and we've got the drag force, which is pulling it up. Now, it's going to stop accelerating when these two things are equal to each other. So it'll stop accelerating, no acceleration. when the drag force is equal to the weight force because then the net force acting on it is going to be zero. And so we can write well a half rho C A V squared is equal to mg and then we can rearrange this to get our terminal velocity. So V is equal to mg and then we've got a half here so that's a two divided by C rho A, and we can take the square root of this to get rid of this squared. So this is an expression for the terminal velocity of an object. Now you'll see in physics there's two different approaches that are commonly used. The one that we've been using the most so far is to look at forces. So we can look at forces, which are vectors, and from the forces we can use Newton's second law to get the acceleration of the object, and then from the acceleration we can, use, we can describe the motion. But another approach is to consider the energy of a system. So energy is useful as it's always conserved within a closed system. We can transfer energy from one object to another and also transform it from one type to another. And energy is a scalar quantity. So formally, the energy of a body is related to its ability to do work. So because it's a scalar, it can be a little bit simpler to use than a vector which has components in every direction. This has just got the one component. So both these approaches should give the same answer, but in some cases, one approach is going to be easier than another. Okay, so we're going to start looking at energy now. So kinetic energy, which we usually give the symbol K, is related to the state of motion of a body. So the kinetic energy is just given by a half mv squared. And energy is measured in joules, which has the symbol capital J. 
So here's a fairly simple example. We're asked to calculate the kinetic energy of a 1,800 kilogram car traveling at 60 kilometers per hour. So the formula is K is equal to half mv squared. We've got the mass here and the speed is equal to 60 kilometers per hour, which is equal to 60 over 3.6, which is 16.67 meters per second. So substituting these in, we've got a half times 1,800 times 16.67 squared. And solving this on the calculator, we get 2.5 times 10 to the 5 joules as the kinetic energy of this car. So very shortly, we're going to require dot products. Now, hopefully these are familiar to you from maths, but just a recap in case you're a little bit rusty or you haven't happened to have come across these yet. If we have a vector A, which is given by A is equal to AXI plus AYJ plus AZK, and another vector B, which is given by B is equal to BXI plus BYJ plus BZK, then if we want to take the dot product between A and B, it is a scalar which is equal to AXBX plus AYBY plus AZBZ. Now geometrically, if we have a vector A and a vector B and we want to take their cross product, it's equal to AB times cos theta, where theta is the angle between them. So if the vectors are parallel, then the angle between them is zero and cos of zero is one. So then we have the maximum cross product. If the vectors are at right angles to each other, then the dot product between them is zero as cos of 90 is zero. So now we know about dot products, we can really look at work. So work is energy transferred to or from an object by means of a force acting on the object. Energy transferred to the object is positive work and energy transferred from the object is negative work. So that means if the object's gaining energy, we say that positive work is done on it. If the object is losing energy, then we say the object is doing work or negative work is being done on it. So work is given by this equation here. Work, which is a scalar because it's energy, is equal to force times distance times cos theta. And this is because it's the dot product between the force which is applied and the displacement of the object. So let's consider the situation below just to show how this makes sense. So we're going to assume that F isn't so large that the block's being lifted up off the surface. We'll assume that vertically there is no net force. So assume the sum of the forces is equal to zero. So because we've got the normal force and the weight force and a component of this force, as long as this force isn't too large, then this will be true. Okay, now we say that work is the energy transferred to or from an object. So work should then be equal to the change in energy. And if the object's not moving up or down, then the only type of energy that it's going to have that's going to change is going to be the kinetic energy. So this will be equal to the change in kinetic energy, which will be the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy, which will be a half mv squared minus a half m u squared, where u is the initial velocity. So we can write this as a half m v squared minus u squared. Now we have the kinematic equation, v squared equals u squared plus 2as, which tells us that v squared minus u squared is equal to 2as. And we can substitute this in here. So we've got that the work is equal to a half m times 2as. So this half will cancel this two, and we can write this as ma times s. And now s is the displacement in the x direction. So let's put a little x down there to show that that's in the x direction. And a is also in the x direction, as in our kinematic equations, all of these things were in the same direction. So we can say that's in the x direction, which tells us that max, that's the net force in the x direction, times s x and now in the case when there's no 
friction or anything, then the only force acting in the horizontal direction is the F force, the Fx. So the x component of the force here is f cos theta, and that's times the distance it goes. So we've shown that this equation here applies at least to this case, if the change in energy is or just a change in kinetic energy, which makes sense. So another question, in which situation is the greatest amount of work done on the block? First of all, a block is pushed against a wall with a force of 100 newtons. Secondly, a block is pushed along a frictionless surface with a force of 10 newtons for 10 seconds. It starts from rest. And third situation, a block is pushed at a constant speed of 1 meter per second along a rough surface by a force with a magnitude of 10 newtons for 10 seconds. Okay, so the correct answer to this one is actually the second one. A block is pushed along a frictionless surface with a force of 10 newtons for 10 seconds when it starts from rest. Now we can see why that is if we go ahead and calculate the works. So the second part of this was if the mass is equal to 2 kilograms, calculate the work done in each of these cases. Okay, so with this first case, we can just use, well, work is equal to the force times the displacement. In this case, the displacement here is zero. So the total work done is zero. In the second case, we've got the work is done by a force this way, and the force is equal to 10 newtons, and it's acting for 10 seconds. So we can use our force dotted with displacement equation, but we're first of all going to need to calculate our displacement. So we've got, well, the force is equal to 10 newtons, which is equal to the mass times the acceleration, which tells us that the acceleration is equal to 10 newtons divided by the mass, which is two kilograms. So that tells us that we've got an acceleration of five meters per second per second. Now we want to know how far it goes and it's going for 10 seconds and starting from rest. So we can use S is equal to UT plus a half AT squared, where U is zero because it starts from rest. So this is equal to a half times five times it's going for 10 seconds. So this is 2.5 times 10 squared, which is 250 meters. So we can now calculate the work which is equal to the force dotted with the displacement. The force is the 10 newtons and the displacement is the 250 meters. So this gives us 2,500 newtons as the work done by the force on this object. Now in the next one, a block is pushed at a constant speed of one meter per second along a rough surface by a force with a magnitude of 10 newtons for 10 seconds. Now, in this case, because it's not speeding up, Newton's first law tells us that there must be two equal and opposite forces. So we've got the force F pushing it, but this is a rough surface. So now we do have a friction force, which is equal and opposite. So the total work is going to be F dot S, the displacement, which we haven't calculated. And we've also got plus the frictional force dot s but these two forces are equal and opposite so this is equal to f dot s minus f dot s substituting in that the frictional force is equal to minus f and so you can see this is going to be equal to zero so this one's zero as well so this brings us to the work kinetic energy theorem, which is very powerful and tells us that for particle-like objects, a change in the kinetic energy, which is the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy, is equal to the work done on the object. So here W is the net work done on the object. So to practice using this, um, for 1121 students, question 7 in set 2, and for 1131 students, question 9. But now we're going to see an example. Okay, so in this 
fairly simple example, a particle moves along the x-axis and we're asked, does the particle's kinetic energy increase, decrease or stay the same if the particle's velocity changes from minus 3 meters per second to minus 2 meters per second? Well, the change in kinetic energy is equal to the final minus the initial, which is equal to a half m. I'm going to pull the half m out the front because the mass isn't changing. So now I'm going to have the final velocity squared minus the initial velocity squared. So in this case, I've got a half m. Now the final velocity is 2, so this is minus 2 squared minus the initial velocity, which was minus 3 squared. And so you can see this is going to be a negative. So I'll have minus a half m times 4 minus 9, which is times 5. And so the kinetic energy has decreased. So decreased. And for this second one, part two, I've got that the change in kinetic energy is equal to a half m. And now I've got the final speed, which is 2 squared, minus the initial speed, which is minus 2 squared. And so this is equal to 0. So it stays the same. So then it asks me, in each of these cases, is the work done on the particle positive, negative, or 0? So in part one, I've got that my kinetic energy decreased, which means that negative work is done on the object as it is losing kinetic energy. And part two, in this case, my kinetic energy didn't change, so the network is zero. So the net work is zero as kinetic energy does not change. So that's how we answer that problem. Okay, so now that we've learned a bit about friction, we're going to apply it to banked curves once again. So a uh, bank turn with friction. So the problem is a car travels around a bank curve with radius r banked at an angle theta. The coefficient of static friction between the wheels and the road is mu s. Derive an expression for the maximum speed of the car can travel at without moving up the track. And we've got a hint. In this problem, it's easier to consider the components parallel to and perpendicular to the slope rather than horizontal and vertical, like we did in the case with no friction. Though, of course, either way will work. It's just which way is easier. So let's go with the easier way. So here's our angle theta that the track is banked at. Here's the car, it is coming out of the screen towards you. Let's draw our forces acting upon it. So we've got the weight force, mg, pulling it down. We've got the normal force, n, which is perpendicular to the track. And we've also got the frictional force, which is pushing it down the track. So that's the frictional force, which is equal to mu s times n. Now, the resultant of all these forces acting upon the car is that it undergoes the centripetal acceleration. So this red one is the resultant force, the sum of the others, and it's given by mv squared on r. Now, the normal force and the frictional force are already perpendicular and parallel to the track. Let's break these other forces into components perpendicular and parallel to the track. So here's our resultant force mv squared on r and we can split it into a component parallel to the track and perpendicular to the track like that. So this is our angle theta in here, this is 90 degrees. Here we've got mv squared on r cos theta and here we've got mv squared on r sine theta. Now we'll do a similar thing for the weight force. Here's our weight force going down. We can split it into parallel to the track and perpendicular to the track. That's 90 degrees. This is theta. This is mg. So we've got mg sine theta down the track and we've got mg cos theta up the track. So let's consider all the forces parallel to the slope. So parallel to the slope. 
So Newton's second law tells us that the sum of the forces is equal to the mass times the acceleration, which in this case is equal to mv squared on r cos theta, because the centripetal acceleration is the resultant acceleration. So we've got mv squared over r cos theta, which is down the slope, is equal to our frictional force, which is mu s times n, plus our weight force, which is mg sine theta, down the track. Now we also need to consider what's going on perpendicular to the slope. So once again, we've got the sum of the forces is equal to the mass times the acceleration, which is the centripetal acceleration, which has got a component mv squared on r sine theta up the slope. So we've got mv squared on r sine theta, well, up perpendicular to the slope. And we've got the normal force, which is also pushing up from the slope. And then down the slope, we've got the component of the weight force, mg cos theta. The frictional force is completely parallel to the slope, so it doesn't contribute in this perpendicular direction. So we can rearrange this expression to get an expression for the normal force. The normal force is equal to the mass, which is common between these two terms here, times g cos theta, that's from this term, plus this one, which is equal to v squared on r sine theta. So we can now substitute this expression for the normal force up into this expression for the force parallel to the slope. So sub into parallel equation. And when we do that, we get mv squared on r cos theta is equal to mu s times n, which is m times g cos theta plus v squared on r sine theta. And then we've got plus the mg sine theta. Now every term here has an m, so we can cancel out those m's to simplify it a little bit. And we can also divide through by cos theta. So if we divide this term by cos theta, we're left with 1. This one's left with 1. When we divide this by cos theta, we end up getting tan theta. And this one we're dividing by cos theta as well. So this one we also get tan theta. Now we're trying to get an expression for the maximum speed. So we want to move all the expressions with a v onto one side and the, the terms without onto the other. So we've got this one, which is v squared on r. And then let's move this one over to this side as well. So this is minus v squared mu s on r tan theta, which is equal to mu s g plus g tan theta. So we can put v squared on r outside of 1 minus tan theta. Sorry, I left off the mu s. It's mu s tan theta is equal to mu s g plus g tan theta. So let's um, go over here and simplify it a little bit more. We've got v squared on r is equal to, I'm going to pull g out the front of this one, g times mu s plus tan theta divided by 1 minus mu s tan theta, which tells me that v squared is equal to rg mu s plus tan theta over 1 minus mu s tan theta. So v is the square root of this. Okay, now it's useful just to logically check this. If mu s equals zero, then we have no friction. So we can check that this agrees with our expression from before. So in this case, we get that the maximum speed is equal to the square root of rg tan theta, because this mu s is zero, and then that's over one. 
And so we end up with v squared equals rg tan theta, which is what we derived for the case with no friction. So this is at least consistent with what we derived before. So in this problem, we're told that a five kilogram block is pushed up a long plane inclined at an angle of 30 degrees. So let's just start by drawing our diagram. This is 30 degrees and we've got a block here which is pushed up this incline. The coefficient of kinetic friction between the block and the plane is 0 0.40. So mu k is equal to 0 0.40 and the coefficient of static friction mu s is equal to 0 0.60. Sketch a displacement versus time, velocity versus time, and acceleration versus time graph for the block if it is originally moving up the slope at 10 meters per second. So u is equal to 10 meters per second up. And your sketch should cover the time interval until it returns to its starting position, if it does return, or reaches greatest height, if not. Okay, so let's sketch our diagrams over here, and we can add to them as we work through the question. So let's make this one acceleration versus the time. And here's the velocity versus the time. So we know that the velocity is initially 10. So we can start there. And this is displacement and time. And we'll call the original displacement 0. So let's start by working out the forces that are acting upon the block. So start with forces, because they're then going to give us the acceleration. And then from the acceleration, we can start to think about the velocity and the displacement. So the forces acting upon the block. Well, we've got the weight force mg pulling it down, and we can divide this into components parallel and perpendicular to the slope. That's theta there, which is 30 degrees. So down the slope, we've got mg sine theta, and perpendicular to the slope, we've got mg cos theta. Now we've also got a normal force, which is perpendicular to the slope, and we've got the frictional force, and the frictional force always opposes the motion. So the frictional force is like this, and the frictional force it starts off moving along the slope, so it starts off as mu k n. So let's see if we can work out n. To work out n, it's a perpendicular force. So let's consider forces perpendicular to the slope. Now we know the net force perpendicular to the slope is zero because it's not accelerating away from the slope or down into the slope. So we've got net force equals zero, which is equal to ma, and that's equal to the sum of the forces acting. So we've got the normal force, which is acting up. The frictional force doesn't have any component this way because it's all parallel to the slope, but the weight force does. So this is minus mg cos theta. So rearranging this, we can see that the normal force is equal to mg cos theta. That's rearranging that part with this part. Okay, so now we have the normal force. So now we can say, well, our frictional force, putting it back up here, is equal to mu k times mg cos theta. So now we can work out the net force parallel to the slope. So parallel to the slope. We've got the mass times the acceleration is equal to, now the weight force is pulling it down the slope, so that's minus mg sine theta. So I'm taking down the slope as my negative. And then I've also got the friction force, which is also acting down the slope. So that's equal to minus mu k mg cos theta. Now there's an m in absolutely every term, so I can cancel out the m's, and I've now got an expression for my acceleration. It's equal to minus g sine theta minus mu k g cos theta. Now I can actually evaluate what this is, because I've got values for each of these. So this is minus 9.8 times sine of 30 degrees minus mu k, which was 0.40, times 9.8 times cos of 30, 
and evaluating this, I end up with minus 8.3. So that's a constant acceleration down the slope. So it's constantly slowing down. And that's meters per second per second down the slope. But this negative here indicates that it's down the slope. Okay, so the next thing that we need to do is work out, well, that acceleration is going to slow it down. So eventually it's going to come to a rest. When it does come to rest, does it start moving again? Now, the maximum static friction force is given by mu s times n, which is equal to mu s times, we've just shown n is equal to mg cos theta, which we can substitute our numbers in. So this is equal to 0 0.60 times 5 times 9.8 times cos of 30, which is equal to 25.5 newtons. And that's opposing the block slipping down. So this is actually up. Now it's going to start to slide down the slope if the component of the weight force down the slope is greater than this. So we've got mg sine theta, which is equal to 5 times 9.8 times sine 30, which is equal to 24.5, and that's down the slope. So this is the weight force pulling it down, but it's not larger than the static friction force, so it doesn't overcome it. So block does not start to slide back down. Okay, so now we have an expression for the acceleration of the block. The acceleration is equal to minus 8.3 meters per second per second. So what we can do now is work out from the initial speed with our kinematic equations, well, how long does it accelerate for before coming to rest, which will tell us when this acceleration graph ends. So let's start with that. So we've got there's some space here. Let's use v equals u plus at. So it comes to rest when v is zero. So we've got zero is equal to 10 minus 8.3 times t. So rearranging this, we get t is equal to 10 divided by 8.3, which is equal to 1.2 seconds. So it comes to rest in 1.2 seconds. So if we have um, 1.2 seconds here, then the acceleration versus time graph is going to look like this. And this is equal to minus 8.3. And the units here are meters per second per second. So we've done our acceleration versus time. Now we can also substitute into this equation to get our speed. So we've got V is equal to U, which is 10 minus 8.3 T. And so this gives us an expression for the velocity. So we can see that this is aligned with a gradient of minus 8.3 and a y-intercept of 10. So if we want to sketch this one, it's going to go through zero at this same time, 1.2 seconds. So we'll have a line like this, and then it just remains in the same place. So then it, it remains with the same velocity of zero. So now we just need to worry about our displacement. So to get displacement, we can use, well, S is equal to UT plus a half AT squared. And so this is equal to 10T plus a half times minus 8.3 times T squared. So this is equal to 10t minus 4.15t squared. So this is going to be a parabolic path. When we substitute in t equals 0, we get 0, which is what we expect. And when we substitute in the t equals 1.2 into this equation here, so s t equals 1.2, on the calculator, we get 6.0 meters. So this tells us that the maximum displacement is 6.0 meters. And so 
again it reaches that at 1.2 seconds so here's 1.2 seconds so at 1.2 seconds that's going to be I'll switch to red that's going to be a nice straight line like that and going up to there you can see that it is a parabola so it's going to look like this Okay, so we've got a force of 20 newtons, which is acting on this block. So let's draw a free body diagram here. We've got F acting down like that. And we can break F into a vertical and a horizontal component. So this angle in here is F and this is theta, sorry, and this is F cos theta. And this here is F sine theta. So we've got a horizontal component F cos theta and a vertical component F sine theta. Now other forces acting, we've got the weight force, which is acting vertically down. We've got the normal force, which is acting vertically up. And then we've got the frictional force, which is going to be opposing this applied force here. And the coefficient of static friction is equal to 0 0.50 and the coefficient of kinetic friction is equal to 0 0.30. But at this point, we don't know if it's going to start moving or not, so we don't know which one we're going to need to use. So it asks, what is the frictional force on the block? So to work out the frictional force, we're going to need to consider the horizontal forces. So horizontally, we've got that the net force, MA, is equal to, well, we've got this F, which is pushing it to the right. So we've got F cos theta to the right and then minus the frictional force, which is to the left. But we don't know with the friction quite how to calculate it yet. We don't know which of these to use. So let's calculate maximum static friction force. So the maximum static friction force is given by mu s times n. So we're going to need to know what this normal force is, but we don't have that yet. So to get the normal force, we're going to need to consider what's happening vertically. So vertically, we know that there is no net force because the block isn't accelerating up or accelerating down. So we've got ma is equal to zero, and we've got the normal force going up. We've got the f sine theta going down, and then we've got the mg going down as well. So this tells us that the normal force is equal to mg plus f sine theta. So we can substitute that into our maximum frictional force here, and we've got mu s times mg plus f sine theta. Now what we can do is we can actually evaluate this because we've got mu s is 0 0.50, m is 10, g is 9.8, that's plus, plus, F, which is 20 times sine 30. And we can evaluate this at, on the calculator and get 54 newtons. So if we're pushing it with more than 54 newtons, it will start to slide. So how much are we actually pushing it with? Well, we're pushing it with just this horizontal component here, the F cos theta. So we can say, well, F cos theta is equal to 20 times cos of 30 and when we calculate that we get 17.3 newtons so we're pushing it with this to the right so that's not enough to overcome the static friction so not enough to overcome static friction which tells us that our block doesn't move so horizontally this acceleration is equal to zero and so our frictional force is just equal to the F cos theta, which we've calculated here. So the frictional force is equal to 17 newtons, and that's to the left, opposing this applied force. Okay, so in this question, we have a car traveling at 60 kilometers per hour. So the initial speed is equal to 60 kilometers per hour, which is equal to 60 divided by 3.6, which is equal to 16.67 meters per second. Now it slams on its brakes. It skids in a straight line to a stop. So because it's coming to a stop, we know that the final speed is zero. 
leaving a 24 meter long skid mark, which suggests that the distance it's taken to stop the displacement since it slammed on its brakes is 24 meters. And we're asked, what is the coefficient of kinetic friction? So we want mu k between the tires and the road. Now we know that the change in kinetic energy is equal to the work done. Now on this case with our car, which is moving forwards, that's the initial velocity, it's got friction acting on it to pull it back. And the frictional force is the kinetic friction because it's skidding, so the tires aren't rolling. So that's given by mu k n. And the normal force in this case is just going to be equal to mg. So we know that the work done is equal to the frictional force times the displacement. Now in this case, the displacement is say in the it's in the direction the car is traveling, which is say the positive direction, and the frictional force is opposing it, it's in the opposite direction. So we're going to get a negative answer here because these two are in opposite directions. So this is going to be given by minus mu k mg times the displacement. Now the change in the kinetic energy, that's going to be the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy, which is equal to a half m u, uh, v squared minus a half m u squared. And v, we've said is zero, the final velocity is zero. So this is equal to a half m u squared. So because the work is the same as the change in kinetic energy, we can set these things equal to each other. So minus mu k mgs is equal to minus a half mu squared. So the negatives cancel out, the m's cancel out. What we're trying to work out is mu k. So we've got mu k is equal to u squared over 2, and then we're also dividing by gs. So now we've got an expression that we can evaluate. I generally find it's easier to come to an algebraic expression and then substitute in in the last step. So let's substitute in now. We've got 16.67 squared and that's in meters per second. Then we've got 2 times g which is 9.8 meters per second per second times the displacement which is the 24 meters. So solving this on the calculator, we end up with 0 0.59 being our coefficient of kinetic friction. And there are no units given here because the coefficient of kinetic friction has no units. So in this question, we have a force described by 2i plus 1j act on a 2 kilogram particle like body initially at rest. So we've got u is equal to 0. Now in part one, it says write an expression to describe the displacement of the body. Okay, so this is actually slightly challenging because we're going to have to get the acceleration and then integrate it a couple of times to get the displacement. So we know that F is equal to MA. So this tells us that A is equal to F over M, which is equal to, because the mass is two kilograms. So we've got one I, plus 1 divided by 2, so 0 0.50j. So this is for the acceleration, and the acceleration is equal to dv dt. So we can integrate this and say, well, the integral of 1.0i plus 0.50j dt, going from time is 0 to time t, is equal to the integral of dv from u, which we're told it's initially at rest. So this is 0 up to speed v. And so we can write, well, 1.0 ti plus 0 0.50 tj is equal to v, which we know is equal to the displacement dt, so the derivative of the displacement. So now we're going to integrate this again. So now we're going from 0 to t, and we've got 1.0 ti plus 0 0.50 tj dt, 
which is equal to the derivative of the displacement. And if we're measuring the displacement from its initial position, then it starts at zero and it's going up to some displacement, which we will call S. So integrating this, we get 0 0.50 T squared I plus half of half is 0 0.25 T squared. And then when we substitute in zero, we've got zeros here. So that's right, substituting in these limits. And then when we integrate this, we have S. So write an expression to describe the displacement of the body. This is our expression to describe the displacement of the body. But I left off my J, so I need to put that J back there. It was there, it's there. So this is a vector expression. Okay, part two, so that's part one, part two, now asked to write an expression for the work done by the force in a time interval t. So we now know the displacement at time interval t and we've got an expression for the force. So we know that the work is equal to the dot product of the force with the displacement. So this is 2i plus 1j times 0 0.50t squared i plus 0.25t squared j. So taking the dot product of this, we multiply the i components together. And so this is 2 times 0.50t squared. And then we also multiply together the j components. So that's 1 times 0.25t squared. And so this gives us 1t squared plus 0.25t squared which gives us 1.25t squared as the total work done in a time interval t. And then part three tells us to use this to determine the speed of the body at time t. So now we can use that the work is equal to the change in kinetic energy of the object, which is equal to a half m v squared minus u squared brackets around there because the half m applies to both of them, but u was equal to zero. So this is equal to a half mv squared. So we've got well a half times m, which is two times v squared is equal to the work, which is 1.25 t squared. And these cancel and I end up with v squared is equal to 1.25 t squared. So v is equal to the square root of 1.25 times t, which I can write as 1.1t if I want. Now it's worth just checking our answer because back in this step here, we did get an expression for the velocity at time t. And um, so we have that the velocity is equal to 1.0t plus 0.50t. So if we draw a little diagram, we've got 1.0t and then we've got 0.50t. So the speed is going to be the resultant here. So that's the square root of 1 squared plus 0 0.5 squared times t, which is also equal to 1.1t. So these are, in fact, the same expression. So that suggests that we've done it correctly. So in this problem, we've got a 5 kilogram block, which is pushed up a long incline plane inclined at an angle of 30 degrees. So let's start by drawing our diagram. 30 degrees, here's our 5 kilogram block. So m is equal to 5 kilograms, and it's pushed up this way. The coefficient of kinetic friction between the block and the plane is 0 0.4, so mu k is equal to 0 0.40, while the coefficient of static friction, mu s, is equal to 0 0.60. The block is originally traveling up the slope with a speed of 10 meters per second. So u is equal to 10 meters per second up the slope. And in part one, we're asked, what is the initial kinetic energy of the block? Okay, so that's not too hard. The kinetic energy is equal to a half m u squared. So this is equal to a half m is five, u is 10. And so, Solving this, we end up with 250 joules as the initial kinetic energy. So how much work is done on the block as it moves up the slope? Okay, well, it's going to move up the slope until it comes to rest. So the final kinetic energy is going to be zero because the block is at 
rest. So this implies that the change in kinetic energy, which is the final minus the initial, and we calculated the initial here, is going to be minus 250 joules, because it's 0 minus 250. And that's going to be equal to the work done on the block. So we're going to have minus 250 joules of work done on the block. Part 3, how far up the slope does the block move? Okay, so we know that the work done is equal to minus 250 joules, and we also know that that is equal to F dot X. Now to work this out, we need to know the total force which is acting, as this is the total force parallel to the slope if X is the distance up the slope. So let's draw all the forces which are acting on our block. We've got the weight force Mg, which is pulling it down, which we can, as always, divide into our components. Here we've got Mg sine theta, and here we've got our Mg cos theta. Now we also have the normal force, which is perpendicular to the slope, so it's acting up like this. And because the net perpendicular force is zero and the only two perpendicular forces are the weight force and the normal force, we've got that this is equal to mg cos theta. And then we also have a frictional force. Now the frictional force opposes the motion, so the motion is going up the slope, so we've got the frictional force down the slope. And the frictional force is equal to mu k times the normal force, and we've got the normal force up here. So we can say, well, this is going to be equal to the force, which is equal to minus mg sine theta. So that's the component of the weight force. And then we've also got the frictional force, which is minus mu k times n, where n is mg cos theta. And the minus sign here is because it's down the slope, times x. So we can solve this to find x, which is the distance it travels up the slope. So this is equal to 250 divided by now mg. That's a common factor in each of these. So I'm going to pull that out the front. And my m is 5 times 9.8. And then I've got my sine 30 plus my mu k, which is 0 0.40 times cos 30. And solving this on the calculator, I get 6.03 meters, which I should just give to two significant figures. So 6.0 meters up the slope. Now we can just check this with the displacement that we calculated in the at the end of the friction lecture and it turns out that we do get the same answer. So we've now got the same answer with the energy approach as we got when we were purely considering the forces. So have a think about which approach you found easier. There's not necessarily one which is easier for everybody for all questions, but you do need to be familiar with both of these approaches.